Thanks for the very nice introduction. You got it, right? Okay. Uh, here is the title of my talk today, Autonomous Vision-Based Inspection of Reinforced Concrete Railway Bridges for Rapid post earthquake Response and Recovery. So it's very nice to meet you all, and uh, it's very nice to visit this uh, great university. I really like that. I really like that, so I bought this t-shirt. <laughs> and uh, uh, I also went to uh, the center area. That was also very nice. So I really, uh, I'm ha very happy to have an opportunity to visit and uh, interact with you guys here today. And uh, you already introduced me very nicely, so I will skip this part. I, I'm just Japanese working in China, but studied in the United States. Uh, where is Zhejiang University? It might be a bit of a difficult question uh, for, for people here. So this is uh, China, this is China, and uh, this is the Zhejiang province. Actually, Switzerland, in terms of latitude, is around here, I guess. So it's much southern part compared to this area. And if you zoom into the Zhejiang province, uh, we have Shanghai, probably Shanghai is a very famous city, and uh, our institute is near, our university is near this Shanghai, maybe one hour, high, one hour by high speed rail. And uh, the main campus is actually here. We are not in main campus because we are, uh, I'm working in international campus. So some pictures of the, uh, our, uh, our campus. And ZJU UIUC Institute, which is a department level institute in Zhejiang University. Uh, this name might be a bit confusing, but that's because uh, ZJU, Zhejiang University, and UIUC uh, worked together to found this institute. And uh, this is the Department for en uh, Engineering in general. So it contains uh, civil, mechanical, and all other engineering fields. So um, but it's a very new institute founded in 2016, so it's growing. Uh, and uh, curriculum, in terms of curriculum, uh, there is a significant coordination with UIUC. So we basically teach and do research in UIUC format and uh, multidisciplinary environment in engineering fields. And uh, I can work there because English is the official language there. Unfortunately, I cannot speak Chinese, but uh, I can still work there. And uh, it's uh, it's still a relatively small institute, which is growing. So currently 41 faculty members in all the engineering fields in this institute. Okay, so that's all for the brief introduction of my uh, university and uh, overview of my research background. I've been working to realize a reliable and efficient civil infrastructure condition assessment through the interdisciplinary approach combining structure engineering, computer vision, machine learning, and so on. In the structure engineering side, I worked on nonlinear seismic analysis of railway bridges and also inverse problem. We measure vibration and perform some kind of system identification to identify potential damage. And in the computer vision side, I worked on computer vision based displacement and strain measurement as part of a project for US, US Army Corps of Engineers. And from my PhD dissertation, I've been working on this rapid post earthquake bridge inspection. Uh, we are trying to uh, automate this uh, process by combining various techniques. And more recently, we are trying to merge those things in the digital twin framework, but that's a kind of ongoing work. And today I'm going to talk about this topic, post earthquake inspection. And here is the outline of my talk today. So first, uh, first, I will discuss motivation and background for this research, and then I will take an overview of the research in this direction. And uh, uh, then I will discuss a little bit about what we are doing now, or next step, immediate next step we are working on. And finally, I will summarize and conclude this talk. So the first part is motivation and background. The motivation for, for this research comes from the importance and challenges of rapidly recovering from severe earthquakes. Uh, and uh, this slide shows an example after 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which is known as a very severe earthquake. And of course, in the area very near to the epicenter, there was a huge damage caused by ground motion itself and also by subsequent tsunami. But the effect impact was not limited to that region. 
if you look at Tokyo metropolitan area, which was about 400 kilometers away from the epicenter. So because of that distance, the degree of structural damage in that area is less than the degree uh, in the area right next to the epicenter. But still, there was a huge confusion or a huge problem after the earthquake. And one very uh, remarkable example was, the, uh, was that after the earthquake, the railway operations were shut down for 16 to 18 hours because they needed to guarantee the safety of the railway facility. So it took so much time. And uh, because people in that Tokyo metropolitan area were heavily dependent on railway systems for commuting and also going to schools, so they couldn't use railway on that day. And eventually, more than 5 million people were in that area were unable to return home on that day. And uh, they just flooded into the street and caused a lot of confusion. So um, definitely, this is not a good situation. We want to improve the situation by having better uh, rapid post earthquake response and recovery uh, process. So before discussing the proposed approach for post earthquake uh, inspection uh, of railway, in railway infrastructure, I'd like to discuss a little bit of current practice for post earthquake inspection. So after an earthquake, typically preliminary assessment is first performed based on some information immediately available. For example, we take a look at the ground acceleration data measured along the railway route and check whether the peak ground acceleration exceeds some threshold like 0.1G. And if the, uh, the, uh, if the peak ground acceleration is larger than that value, we can suspect that there may be some damage in that area. And then we can perform detailed inspection by human inspector. And if any damage is observed, retrofit or repair will be performed. But the problem of this approach is that this initial preliminary assessment tends to be overly conservative. So, so many bridges are selected, so many infrastructure uh, railway facilities were selected for the detailed inspection. So eventually this entire process takes a lot of time. So to uh, solve that problem, what we want to do eventually is something like this. After an earthquake, preliminary inspection is performed autonomously with the help of, for example, UAVs, a mass area vehicle. And the purpose of this step is to perform this preliminary inspection with significantly higher accuracy. So hopefully after this step, uh, some suspected part of the, ra uh, suspect, uh, the, the railway facilities with some suspected damage will be selected, but much fewer facilities will be selected. And for those structures only, we can perform detailed inspection and uh, we can also do retrofit and repair. So uh, this research focuses on this first part, preliminary inspection, and uh, investigates an autonomous UAV-based post-earthquake inspection of railway infrastructure that minimizes disruption to transportation systems. So um, railway bridges are critical links to the safe and uninterrupted operations of railway systems, and in particular in many countries, including Japan, China, and probably Switzerland, uh, reinforced concrete railway violence, railway bridges, uh, accounts for a significant portion of railway routes. So uh, with that, uh, I, uh, in this research, I focus on this uh, railway, uh, you know, reinforced concrete railway bridges as a target structure. So this slide illustrates uh, some envisioned autonomous post earthquake inspection approach that we want to realize uh, with this uh, in the longer term uh, in this research. So after an earthquake, the UAV goes to a bridge, bridge site, and first a UAV uh, recognizes the critical structural component that need to be inspected. So that's the first step, bridge component recognition and localization. And based on that recognition, UAV will fly to those components to take a close look or uh, take close up images of those components. That's the second step, vision-based UAV navigation. And those collected images are further post-processed to uh, see whether there is any structural damage or not. 
So that's the third step, region-based structural assessment. <coughs> and uh, eventually we want to automate this entire process. Uh, but of course, this is a bit of complex problem. We cannot even uh, investigate this problem easily without any appropriate testing environment where we can try many things. And a good, uh, you know, good potential solution to that problem is to use a synthetic environment. For example, this is a synthetic environment that I developed relatively recently. We can use such simulation environment and uh, we can try various algorithms related to those three steps. We can also uh, investigate the combination of those algorithms in those environments so that we can uh, more, uh, uh, so, so that the investigation itself is facilitated. So with that, I'd like to talk about the first part, bridge component recognition and localization. The algorithm that I use in this part of the research is something called semantic segmentation or monocular depth estimation. <clears throat> the idea is that we can predict, we want to predict the maps of structural component labels or depths that are means near, white means far, so this like a depth map. We want to, we, uh, this type of algorithm can predict those maps from input images. And this, these algorithms are supervised learning algorithms. So we give some input images and the corresponding ground truth maps, and we train the algorithms so that after training, the algorithm can predict accurate maps for new images. So uh, as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, similar to any other applications, we started this uh, investigating this approach by actually trying those algorithms to a small custom-made data set. So this is this slide shows some uh, uh, summary of the developed data set for bridge component segmentation. We collected uh, 1,500 images from various sources, including Google Street View or some public data set. And then we manually annotated all those images for structural component, and we divided it into training set and testing set. And we applied a deep semantic segmentation algorithm for this six layer F3 convolutional network to perform this task. And the left side shows some example preliminary results. The left column shows input images. The middle column shows the ground truth notations uh, created manually. And the right side shows the algorithm output. And we can definitely see some potential of applying those algorithms to those real world images. But of course, from this preliminary application, we can also see challenges. So um, first, of all, first of all, it is promising, but of course it is not perfect. Right? The semantic segmentation accuracy needs to be improved so that it can be used as part of more complex system. And uh, the possible approach to improve the algorithm performance is to enrich the training data or improve the efficiency and accuracy of manual image annotation. And also, you know, the synthetic environment that, that I mentioned previously is considered as a, a good potential uh, solution to this uh, problem because it can provide, uh, all, you know, it can automatically generate accurate ground truth data uh, because everything is controlled in the synthetic environment. Getting ground truth data is very easy. And also we can use synthetic environments as a testing environment for autonomous systems. So with that, uh, in the next part, I'd like to develop the synthetic environment that represent the target application scenario, the bridge inspection scenario. And after getting the synthetic data, we revisit the task of autonomous structure assessment so that we can get much better performance from those algorithms. So the second part of this talk is about development of synthetic environments. <clears throat> So in this part, I focus on this type of target structure, Japanese high-speed railway products. There are two reasons for uh, choosing this type of structure as a target of this part of the research. So first of all, as you can see here, the structure is relatively simple, not, not super complicated bridges. So that's a very big advantage for some preliminary stage investigation. And also, it's not just simple. So when this type, uh, this type of high-speed rail, railway was constructed, these type of bridges were mass-produced 
So that means if we can develop a nice automatic system that works very well on this particular type of the structure, we can expect to apply the same automatic system to all structures produced by the same pro, uh, design procedure. So we have many, many of those bridges in, uh, in Japan and some other countries. So that's uh, another reason that I focus on this type of structure in this part. Uh, this slide shows the general steps for creating synthetic environments. So when we want to create a photorealistic synthetic environment, first of all, we have to create define geometry by creating mesh. And then at the same time, we have to prepare texture images that specify how each part of the structure looks like. And those texture images are assigned to different parts of the model so that we can get the photorealistic computer graphics model. And once, once we have this model, we can put synthetic camera model anywhere in this environment to render photorealistic images. And because this is synthetic environment, we know the ground truth information. So with the images, we can also get the ground truth for, for example, structural component types, or ground truth for structural damage, or ground truth for depth. Those things can be done automatically once the model is set up. And this research uses the Splendor uh, uh, 3D modeling software to implement those steps. And in particular, we use, uh, uh, we use some Python API programming to automate those modeling steps so that we can run that code many times to produce many uh, synthetic environments and data sets. This slide shows a little bit about how I generated the random geometry of the structure. So uh, the geometry generation, mesh generation, follows the actual design procedure adopted by this type of railway bridges. That was called standardized design procedure. Uh, and uh, the, the basic idea is that based on a few input parameters like viaduct height, trajectory types like the trajectory straight or curved, or uh, soil conditions, based on those few parameters, uh, they apply a set of design tables like that. When the viaduct height is this number, columns should have this cross section. They have a few tables like that. And uh, they highly standardize this uh, design procedure. So what we can do is to implement those design procedure so that we can randomly sample those input parameters. And we can apply the exact design procedure to generate many, many bridges randomly. And all those bridges follow the actual design procedure. And in terms of uh, texture generation, because uh, we want to consider damage of the structure, uh, we also use some computer graphics techniques to mimic the, uh, the, the damage to reinforce concrete. And again, in the synthetic environment, uh, we can easily get ground truth annotations. So by combining all those things, we develop a data set called Tokaido dataset. And this, uh, this uh, slide shows a few examples from the dataset, including images and structural component annotations, structural damage annotations, and depth maps. Some other uh, example, so we can see that the viaducts with different geometries, textures, and also damage scenarios were generated randomly and automatically. So um, to summarize the, uh, the, the, the basic properties of the developed Tokaido dataset, it is a large-scale synthetic dataset for reinforced concrete railway viaducts. And this dataset was produced by using 200 different environments. And in, in each synthetic environment, we have 10 uh, different viaducts uh, with random geometries and textures and damage scenarios. So in total, there are 200 different viaducts in this dataset viaduct models in the data set. And using those synthetic environments, we've uh, rendered more than 8,000 regular images, more than 7,000 close-up images, and 3,000 pure texture images with those resolution and camera focal lengths. Those are also, that, is, that was also sampled. And in the synthetic environment, in addition to imaging, we can get ground truth annotations for structural component, structural damage, and depth. And, uh, here, I emphasize once again that all this process, data set generation process is programmed so that every time we run the code, new environment is created, new data set is created. 
So now we have a significant support from synthetic data. So we want to revisit the bridge component recognition and localization problem to see how uh, bit, uh, how much the performance improves by this uh, uh, you know, data databases. And the algorithm is same. We apply the semantic segmentation algorithm, but now we use this uh, large scale synthetic data set. We mix a little bit of real world images here and uh, uh, we predict those uh, output maps. And uh, we we trained 58 convolutional, the, the network is 58 convolutional layers. So the algorithm itself is a kind of standard algorithm, but it's a relatively deep network. So if you if you don't have a good data set, training this uh, network is a bit difficult. And in terms of data set, so you know, we use uh, more than 7,000 synthetic data set, uh, synthetic images from Tokaido data set, and we mix a very small amount of real world data so that uh, we can also, the network can also perform on the real world data. Some example results after training, the left column shows the input images, input testing images. The middle column shows the ground truth annotation. Uh, so these were testing real world images. So the ground truth was uh, made manually and the right side shows the network prediction. And we can see that compared to the preliminary results shown in the beginning of the talk, uh, we can get much higher performance with very high level of detail. And we can very clearly see the improvement. Unfortunately, for depth prediction, we didn't have the right uh, real world uh, data set. So we just did a preliminary study by applying it to the synthetic testing images. So these are input images, those are ground truth, those are prediction, and uh, the right side shows the, the visualization of the error, where blue means accurate, red means uh, less accurate, and those are also a uh, reasonable resource. Okay, so now we got some uh, improved results for bridge component recognition and localization, so we want to build uh, the autonomous UAV navigation approach on top of those recognition modules. So um, before talking about the autonomous inspection, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the analogy to manual visual inspection here. So if a human inspector wants to inspect this bridge, what that inspector might do is first of all, probably take a quick look at the global structure and uh, have a partial understanding of the target structural system. And at the same time, the, the inspector may figure out the first critical components that need to be inspected so that the inspector can start the inspection mission. Based on the initial recognition, the inspector will go to the first critical structural component and uh, take a close look at the target surface to make assessment. But during that process, the inspector, human inspector, experiences more and more viewpoints. The inspector look at the bridge from various angles. So during the inspection, the inspector's understanding of the target structure is enhanced. And as a result, after the inspector finishes inspecting the first critical component, they can smoothly move on to the inspection of the next component. So that's something very high level, uh, abstract explanation of what might happen during human inspection process. But what we want to do in this part is to formulate these things, these strategies in the form that computer-based computer, computer -based algorithms can perform. And uh, we want to demonstrate that computer-based uh, computer approach in the synthetic environment as a first step toward full realization. And this is the approach that we developed with the help of synthetic environments. So we assume input image stream from a UAV camera, and the input image is processed in two ways. The first way, maybe I can turn on, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so the first way is frame-wise image processing. That is basically frame-wise semantic segmentation and depth estimation. So that was uh, discussed in the previous part. And at the same time, this uh, image stream is processed to create sparse point cloud data of the environment. 
so this could be done by the algorithms like SLAM and structure for motion. Um, and then those data are combined to obtain the past point cloud data. And once we have this one, for example, if we want to inspect bridge columns, we can focus on this red part of the point cloud, cut column part of the point cloud, and do some additional processing to detect the actual column shapes represented by this uh, you know, cuboid shapes. And once we identify the shapes representing the bridge columns, uh, we can set the appropriate viewpoints so that the uh, image can be taken effectively for inspection purposes. So, um, you know, actually we try, we developed some preliminary uh, implementation of this approach. We tried in synthetic environments. Initially it failed many times, but we solved problem one by one. And eventually uh, what we could do in the end was a demo prototype system that were demonstrated in the synthetic environment. And this is a synthetic environment that we were working on. So it has three blocks of railway viaducts. And in particular, this research focuses on the inspection of this middle uh, middle block of the uh, this environment of the railway viaduct. And uh, this is a demo video. The left side shows the image input image stream. The middle shows the UAV path shown in 2D map. And the right side shows the UAV part in 3D map. And uh, the white part is finished part, and the green part is the planned part. So after the UAV fly around the bridge, they started understand, getting the initial understanding of the target structure. And based on that understanding, this uh, simulated UAV uh, recognizes the structural bridge columns as a critical member. And based on that, identified shape, they automatically set the right viewpoints for inspection. They go to those, those viewpoints to collect images that are suitable for structural inspection purpose. And uh, what's interesting about this result is that, so, it, and uh, you know, during this process, by further processing the new frames, uh, the, the UAV's understanding of the target structure is enhanced continuously. And as a result, near the end of inspecting this particular block of the bridge, I want to skip a little bit, or maybe I can, sorry. Uh, okay, let, let's just wait 10 seconds so that we see some difference in the middle map. So the yellow part, for example, is the recognized shape of the bridge columns by the algorithm. But near the end of this inspection, because they got get more and more frames to process, they started to understand, they started to recognize the bridge column in the next adjacent uh, block. And this means that after the inspection of this particular block of the railway viaduct, the UAV can smoothly move on to the inspection of the next block that is kind of consistent with the actual human inspection. Okay, so uh, so the the, uh, the next part is about how to process the collected images for, from structure assessment. There's a vision-based post-earthquake structure assessment. And the algorithm is very similar to the algorithm used for bridge component recognition. Basically, we want to do semantic segmentation of structural damage. So we want to predict damages from synthetic, uh, using synthetic images and a little bit of real world data as a training data. But uh, if we just did that initially, we faced some problems. So these are some preliminary results uh, of training semantic segmentation algorithm for damage. As you can see here, for example, we identify a lot of false positive damage detections and the reason is very actually very simple. Those components are far away from the camera. So image resolution was not enough at all to perform any meaningful recognition. But if you use synthetic data set to train the network, synthetic data always has the ground truth data, even if the data is not meaningful. So that's why network training process was confused a lot. And eventually the trained algorithm detects a lot of images everywhere in the file components when the resolution is not enough to accurately you know, characterize the damage. 
So to solve that problem, we decided to focus on relatively near surfaces. So when we trained the network, we didn't use all uh, damaged data from all surfaces, but we used the damaged data from relatively near surface, like a pixel per centimeter is larger than 1.5. That's kind of the threshold we used to train the network. And also we used a, a little bit of real world data. We combined them together to train the network. And this slide shows some example recognition results, damage recognition results. The left side shows uh, uh, testing real world images. The middle column shows the ground truth annotations created manually. And the right side shows the uh, network prediction. And for, maybe from the first three images, we can see a significant potential of the approach by getting very accurate recognition. In the fourth image, we can probably see both the potential and challenge. We can even recognize some part of the very severe damage that was not actually existing in the synthetic environment. So we can uh, successfully recognize this part of the damage, at least to some extent. But for this damage, the recognition was perfectly missing. The reason was because when we trained the network, we only trained the network for relatively near damage. So what we have to do is to do some kind of post-processing and uh, what, I, uh, what I propose here is to use something called Region of Reliable Damage Recognition, or RRDR. So this, the definition is the image region with a predicted depth smaller than 1.5 pixel per centimeter. So that is exactly the thresholds that I used to train the network. So what, what I did for uh, image post-processing is that, first of all, we have the raw output from the damage recognition network. And uh, we use the depth prediction network that I developed previously to, uh, to figure out which part of RDR, which part is not RDR. And if the damage recognition is, inside, uh, is not inside RDR, that is uh, excluded. And if the damage recognition is inside RDR, we further combine the results with the structural component recognition uh, results to you know, further uh, as the information of where, where the damage was uh, occurred. And the output of this entire processing is a masked image that contains the information of uh, the damage and uh, region of reliable damage recognition and also the structural component types where the damage happens. And these are some examples of the final output of the system. So first of all, depth prediction network was used to omit the known RDR regions. And RDR regions were further masked for structural component type and structural damage types. And hopefully, this type of output could benefit the decision maker uh, to, to, uh, to, to figure out the, the, the actual state of the uh, damage after uh, earthquakes. So those are kind of the current status of this uh, research about old, automating the entire process of post earthquake inspection. But of course, there are some many future steps. And uh, here I'd like to discuss a few ongoing extensions to this research. So um, the, in this research, we used a lot of synthetic data to boost the performance of the algorithms, but we didn't really optimize the way we use the synthetic data. We just got a lot of synthetic data. We mix that with a small amount of real world data and we just trained the algorithm. So we just uh, did a very basic standard, uh, you know, easy approach to mix synthetic and real world data. But here, what, I, uh, what we want to do is to train the network using a lot of synthetic data with some real world images but with that annotation, because even a small amount of images, even annotating a small amount of real world images takes a lot of time. So we can collect some real world images, but we only collect images. We don't collect any annotation, but we have images and, images and annotations from the synthetic environment. And we use that uh, entire data uh, and we leverage those dead, different kinds of data uh, in an opt optimal manner to perform accurate recognition. That's the goal uh, of this part of the extension. And the algorithm 
uh, used for that purpose is something called unsupervised domain adaptation. These two students are working on that topic. And uh, so uh, this is a uh, this slide shows some preliminary results of unsupervised domain adaptation that tries to optimize the use of synthetic data. The left side shows the input image. The second column shows the ground truth annotation. And the third column shows source only. That means we use synthetic data set only. We train the network and we apply it to the real world images. Because synthetic data and real world images are different, the network predictions are not very good. But after applying this UDA and supervised domain adaptation, we use both synthetic data, annotated synthetic data, and un annotated real world data to train the network. Uh, we can get significantly better performance without any annotation from real world images. Another extension that I'd like to discuss in the end of this talk is we only focused on a single type of relatively simple bridge in this presentation. But of course, in the future, we might want to consider the extension to different kinds of bridges. And to begin with that extension, we are now trying to develop uh, something called random bridge generator that can randomly generate six different types of bridges, synthetic environments of six different types of bridges randomly, and also following some uh, actual design practice. Those four students are working on that. And the basic approach is that we just, uh, we take a real bridge inspectors reference manual from Federal Highway Administration by examining that uh, reference manual, we identify the major uh, bridge types and the major structural component types that constitute those bridge types. And we create that kind of a mind map that shows the hierarchy of different components and different subsystems. And following this uh, mind map, we actually implement the random generation of those components one by one, following some uh, uh, suggestions from relevant design gu guidelines. And for example, we can generate some mesh of different types of bridge randomly uh, like this. And uh, by converting it to computer graphics model, we can see some, uh, we can generate some uh, photorealistic raw images. So you know, we only model bridges. So this didn't have any background. So we just added some background to uh, for, for better use for training purpose. And uh, similar to the previous discussion, we can get the corresponding ground truth component level and depth maps. Few other examples, so we can generate at least a few different types of bridges now. Okay, so um, with that, I'd like to summarize and conclude my talk. So first of all, synthetic environment, uh, in particular, the synthetic environment of reinforced concrete railway pattern was demonstrated to be very effective for training advanced computer vision-based recognition algorithms. And with that help, we developed a, a bridge, we performed bridge component recognition and localization using semantic segmentation for depth prediction algorithms. And we combined those approaches, all those technical elements to create a prototype of vision-based UAV navigation that were demonstrated in the synthetic environment. And finally, the output, the collected images were post-processed to show the damage locations, uh, show, show the structural damage, as well as the property of that damage recognition, including the recognition reliability and the structural component types. So to end the talk, I'd like to just show you one video of a long-term future that we could probably uh, try to aim at. So after the earthquake, there are so many bridges in the entire affected region. Uh, in this talk, I just talked about a single UAV, single bridge case, but in reality, you have many, many bridges, many, many UAVs. By uh, developing and combining those technical elements in an effective way, I uh, predict, uh, I expect that this type of, uh, you know, fully autonomous inspection, structural inspection of the entire city may be uh, realized in the future, and I want to Keep working for this type of future. And uh, thanks for all your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to discuss.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So how, what do you think? Is there an estimation of how much faster it would take um, if uh, this inspection were been done by, um, by these uh, drones? Okay, so uh, that's a very good question, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, you know, in terms of very accurate quantitative estimation, I don't have, uh, you know, such thing, but just a prediction. Um, so, you know, after the earthquake, so much time is taken for structural inspection, not because this, uh, you know, visual recognition takes, human visual recognition takes time, but the main problem is that, first of all, the inspector is also affected by the earthquake, right? They, they may have some damaged houses. So getting right amount of human resources for inspection is, first of all, very difficult. That's the uh, uh, first factor that delays the structural inspection. And then uh, we, the railway, infra railway infrastructure need to be inspected to resume railway operation. But inspector may need to take a railway to go to the railway site. <laughs> <laughs> that's a problem. So you know that, that's a you know kind of, kind of a, a bit of extreme statement. But uh, inspector is also affected by the traffic, uh, you know, problem caused after the after. So um, you know, once the inspector reaches the bridge and uh, take a look at the target surface, probably the inspection efficiency may not be very different, even if we apply some automation algorithm. But this uh, entire automating this entire process is very important uh, to speed up the, uh, the process because of those two factors mainly. And uh, uh, yeah, so if we can, you know, prepare for the earthquake by uh, putting some right amount of UAVs along the road before the earthquake, and if we can prepare for the big earthquake in a very effective manner the time reduction might be uh, might be huge. Uh, like uh, most of the, you know, this travel time may be reduced and uh, there, there may be no labor manpower problem. So uh, hopefully, so, you know, of course that's a bit of a, a you know, extreme comparison, but uh, hopefully uh, that, that uh, there is a huge uh, potential for significantly reducing the time needed for structure inspection. I think that's a probably answer that I can provide right now. <laughs> I have a question. Thanks for the nice talk. Yeah. Um, like you showed that uh, part of your research, you're also looking into the manuals, for example, fine textures are done. I guess you showed the American uh, mm -hmm. manual, right? So you're taking into consideration also practical uh, uh, cases. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, have you showed your results to kind of practitioners that do the visual inspections or agencies or even operators of? Bridges. Okay, so that's um, a very good question, and uh, that's actually the the, the next step. Okay. But uh, uh, so you know, before that, as a basic philosophy, I want to I don't want to just make any random thing, but I uh, we just want to make some practically meaningful random thing, and uh, uh, of course this is a still a preliminary development for for this extension, but. Uh, as a starting point, we are definitely based on the real inspection guidelines that are used by real inspector. Uh, yeah, but you know, <laughs> uh, the validation is uh, you know the, the next step actually. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the very nice uh, pointing out. Very nice. Yeah. All right. Are there some questions from the Zoom public? If so, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Doesn't seem that way. I, I will have a question. A bit on the line of uh, what Sophia said. Mm -hmm. Could you envisage as an intermediate solution mm -hmm. to have the drones mm -hmm. for data collection mm -hmm. and then have the inspectors off site mm -hmm. reviewing the data? Uh, okay, okay. Inspectors on site reviewing the Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you know. The, the the research that I presented here is something like fully autonomous structure inspection. So I presented something like a, a first step toward very big goal. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, the inspection format is not only pure manual and pure automatic. We, we should have various, uh, you know, intermediate levels. I fully agree with that. And that's why, like, uh, 
you know, augmented reality systems or human in the loop systems are quite popular nowadays because we can get the benefit from the AI or computer vision. And at the same time, we can get the benefit of human based approach. Um, so yeah, definitely we should consider those things uh, until we can actually realize the fully autonomous structure inspection. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, how we involve human, that's probably a very interesting question with many discussions. Uh, you know, that person may be on site or that person may not be on site or also here, this type of fully autonomous inspection might be most useful for, you know, typical bridges, right? Uh, this uh, here I consider the gray post concrete railway viaduct, and because that was relatively simple, and uh, there are many of them, so automating that will have a huge impact. But let's say you have a very monumental, single, very long span bridge, like a Golden Gate Bridge or something like that. Uh, you know, because that's a single, single, very unique bridge. Autonomous system may not may have some problem uh, because we have to develop. A unique automatic system for that particular bridge that may be not very efficient. For those monumental or those very unique bridges, we could probably borrow more uh, effort from human based approach. So, if we can, uh, if we can inspect a few very important, very difficult problems with the help of, with a lot of help from humans, and we can, uh, the, the automatic system can take care of all the other, you know, trivial ones. I think that's the right way of coordination between humans and the, uh, the, the autonomous system in the future. So uh, in this research, I'd like to uh, eventually develop some fully autonomous system that can take care of everything else. <laughs> and uh, and uh, for, for humans, uh, humans can put more and more efforts on really for that part of the uh, infrastructure system. Hopefully that answers yeah, that yeah, part yeah. of the question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one more question. Yeah. So I can imagine one of the problems is the mismatch between the synthetic mm -hmm. data set yes. and the real world images. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this it's always going to be a mm -hmm. large simplification mm -hmm. in the synthetic yeah. data. Have you considered using something like uh, neural radiance fields to augment your yeah, that's synthetic a, data? That's a very uh, good question. <laughs> I really want to do that. I'm waiting for new students, new public students to come. <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, that's a that's a really important point, and uh, uh, you know some uh, you know generative models are the, the uh, approach definitely the approach to uh, fields the details or eventually to fill the entire uh, to to replace the entire model generation process. Uh, I don't think that that. Complete replacement may happen immediately because, uh, uh, you know, it's the purpose is not not just to say, "Wow, cool!" But we really need to have the structurally important component, and by uh, you know, by by mistake mistakenly removing those uh, important components would have a huge consequence. So we probably need some uh, at least in the very near future, we need some uh, you know coordination between the model or the, the code-based approaches and the, those uh, data-driven approaches. But anyway, for, uh, you know, for, you know, for feeling the difference between those two, so, you know, for like a basic primary structural components, we could take the procedural approach, but for, uh, similar to the, the last question, uh, for, you know, everything else that are too time consuming to model fully, we could uh, get help from those things immediately. Uh, and another perspective is that, uh, you know, getting the, uh, so our, the, the goal of such effort is to, uh, you know, map the, the fields of difference between synthetic and real, but uh, our goal may not be to have the extremely realistic synthetic model, but our goal is to have the right algorithms that can perform on the real world environment. So sometimes getting super nice synthetic model may not be the optimal way to adjust the algorithm to the real world environment. Sometimes uh, we can just use uh, some rough synthetic environment and we get some uh, 
because the algorithm only process images, the algorithm does not, uh, does not directly process a model of synthetic environment. So some, uh, that's why we consider unsupervised domain adaptation first, because uh, the uh, the algorithm can use uh, synthetic data, relatively coarse synthetic data, but we can get uh, uh, real world images from the exact uh, situation where the inspection is performed. And uh, that kind of approach, uh, for, for this particular preliminary demonstration, it actually worked really fine. So if this, uh, if the problem is nicely defined and if we can set up such algorithm, uh, you know, uh, to, to optimize the use of synthetic environment, that might be another approach to consider. But if you want to do more complex thing in the 3D real, uh, 3D environment, definitely having better synthetic environment is the only solution. In that case, probably uh, we have to uh, get a lot of help from uh, the neural radiance field or some other generative uh, models to 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 supplement the missing details. Yeah. Maybe a bit general answer. <laughs> Hope that uh, was interesting. All right. Yeah. Uh, I would have a question if we still have some time. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation, by the way. Um, I was just maybe a stupid question, but have you checked how the model performs uh, under occlusion? Meaning, like, what if there's because like all these bridges are like empty, right? But what if there's like a vehicle or like people in front? Like, is the model robust to that? And then also like if the bridge collapses and it's not part of the data set, does the bridge become invisible to the model? Like what, what happens in these kinds of scenarios? Okay, okay. Thanks for a very uh, nice and important question. So first of all, in terms of occlusion, regular occlusion, non-damage occlusion, um, so our current uh, to cut, uh, synthetic data set uh, doesn't model such occlusion in the synthetic environment. So if we do, for example, uh, let's see, I may not have the right slide for that. Uh, definitely we check that. And uh, of course, if we don't uh, get some additional information from somewhere else, like a small amount of real world data, if we just use source only data, the network has no clue to learn those uh, occlusion uh, like a car or fences uh, that are commonly seen in the uh, real world images. Uh, the, the, the network prediction fails to get accurate predictions for those parts if you don't have any additional information. So what, I, uh, what we did in the uh, main part of the talk was to just add a small amount of real world images with those patterns. And uh, we expect that the network can learn at least uh, a part of those pattern from those real world images. And uh, that was actually a kind of uh, uh, turned out to be kind of right because uh, of course the, the accuracy was not as good as the accuracy for structural components that were modeled exactly in the synthetic environment, but uh, a small real world data set worked uh, relatively well to compensate for that kind of a missing, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, error caused by the missing pattern. So uh, in the main part, not perfect, but we did some compensation by small amount of data. For this, uh, for UDA, UDA of co uh, also, if we don't have the foreground, uh, foreground pattern or collusion, uh, we, if we don't have any annot annotated data for foreground, foreground occlusion, the resulting network can, cannot perform well on those patterns. But uh, uh, also, you know, we, we needed to add a small number of images, real world images with those patterns with annotation. And uh, with that, uh, it turned out that the 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 the, 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 the uh, performance gain by using this UDA was larger for those. Uh, Occlusion, uh, occlusion patterns. So um, probably there are there is more room for improvement. But uh, my answer would be we, we did something and we checked uh, that pattern and we saw some level of compensation. And uh, for you know extraordinary damage like bridge collapse, so that's a, a different problem. Um, you know probably. The current algorithm cannot predict the the uh, the masks accurately for those uh, 
complete collapse, for example, problem because uh, you know in the data set there was no such pattern and the network has no clue to you know uh, recognize those patterns accurately. So uh, we didn't, we haven't actually uh, gone to the complete collapse problem. So if you want to do that, if you want to apply a similar approach for that problem, probably we need some uh, uh, synthetic model of you know collapse structure. But what we did related to that perspective is that so you know for example this type of damage so. Uh, you know, missing core of the concrete. That is something that were not modeled in the synthetic data because synthetic data basically focuses on the case where the overall shape was preserved. Um, so the performance was not very good. But in our uh, a bit newer work, we also modeled this type of uh, damage, uh, like a missing core concrete. And uh, if we model that in the synthetic environment, uh, it's still ongoing work, but uh, we, we saw that uh, there is a huge potential that that kind of damage is also recognized accurately. So, um, yeah, if you want to uh, extend the discussion further into the collapse bridge, probably we can, you know, take the similar approach again and uh, do at least some um, course modeling of the collapse structure and we can get similar performance gains. That's my prediction. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for question. So if there are not any questions left, we have to consider the room soon. Okay. So <laughs> let's give uh, another round of applause. Thank you. Uh, maybe may I stop sharing the screen? Yeah, I also have to stop the recording.